Thank you all for your speeches today. They were great. Um, I, I was actually talking to Tony at the break, and, and one of the things I, I mentioned was where, where I grew up, and you could probably tell where. We kind of went from Rome to the Renaissance, and then we had like the nights in between for like a day in school. And I was wondering, like, in fact, what, what we kind of learned was more about the Holy, Rom Holy Roman Empire rather than Byzantium. And I was wondering if you had any explanation for that, because what you were talking about was really great today. But I pretty much know nothing about that. There's two answers to that. One is that the Byzantines, if I can use the B word, are, are not terribly sexy. The, the Romans have pretty togas and they march up and down waving their swords and conquering places, whereas the Byzantines spent most of their time in church. Um, a, a longer answer is that um, w when we study history, we, 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 there's a natural tendency to focus on our own parents and grandparents in civilizational terms. And so, of course, in England, we study the history of England. And before that, we studied the history of the Romans and the Greeks. And that, now, although um, our parents, to some extent, dispossessed those grandparents, we, we, we shoehorn them into our family. And we sort of put the Jews in, and sometimes the Egyptians and Babylonians, because they're, they're quaint. Um, the Byzantines, they don't really fit into the family tree. They're sort of they're, they're cousins or uncles and aunts, and we feel a little uncomfortable with them. They, they're a bit alien. They're not, um, not, not quite like us. And, and I think that's one reason why there has generally in countries like England and maybe France and Germany, less interest given to the um, Byzantine Empire th th than to the other medieval states. Um, of course, it has changed. It has changed. There is a lot of emphasis on, the, on Byzantine matters nowadays, but uh, this is a fairly recent development. I would like to ask Mr. Gap, um, this um, pattern of the division of Europe into East and West, um, well, it looks for me that it is a recurrent pattern in history, and it even, you could even make the, the point, the argument that it's, Europe is divided between East and, and West again. And um, yeah, what's, um, what's your take on that? Is that is it a, a pattern you would recognize too? And why would you do such a thing, even if you have a one empire and, and you divide it between East and West? Why not bet divide it between North and South, or between, I don't know, could, 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 could have come up with any other uh, division? Uh, the, the division of the Roman Empire in 395 made very good military and administrative sense. Um, you, you divide it down the middle between Italy and the Balkans so that the western part can focus on the uh, pressure on the Rhine and the um, English Channel frontiers and the eastern half can focus on the pressure from the Persians. It uh, was a very good, it, it allowed for a very good division of military attention uh, you, you also have the fact that the Western half, broadly speaking, you, used Latin as its official language, and the Eastern half used Greek. It's not an entire, it's not a perfect fit. Um, it just seemed to make sense. I don't think that that division has entirely persisted. Um, it's a, in, in some degree it has, I suppose. But, but many years ago, uh, an American friend of mine suggested that if you want to see the real, if you want to see a real civilizational footprint in Europe, you should superimpose the borders of the Habsburg Empire onto a map of modern Europe. Everything, out, everything inside those borders may be a bit corrupt, but it, it is broadly decent and civilized. Everything outside is just some, some, some howling storm of despotism and corruption and general hellishness. Um, I, I think that would be a more important um, footprint of an old empire nowadays than 
the division of the Roman Empire into East and West. Very interesting points that you made about rights. And the question I have is, um, are you merely against the proliferation of rights in the modern age uh, and would recommend a return to uh, just a few very limited rights like negative rights, uh, classical liberalism? Um, or are you merely making a point about the psychology and not about the philosophy or po politics of rights? Or would you go further and say that one should do away with the whole notion of rights in toto and rather talk on, like in law and economics, what is most efficient in the particular environment? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, I think in practice, uh, negative rights are advantageous and most of us are quite pleased if we can say what we like and we're free of, um, of uh, arbitrary arrest and so on and so forth and supposed equality under the law uh, and irrespective of any uh, metaphysical justification for them uh, I think we, we are very pleased with them. I think when it comes to other rights uh, their effect is intrinsically to proliferate and um, and therefore I think they would, if we were to to recede from these rights they would soon come back it would be like um, a tide that would, comes back and forth um, but I don't say that I have the solution to this problem because I think it's now at any rate very deeply ingrained in people that they have the rights, including the rights of uh, those enumerated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think what, what you see generally after, uh, what, what you see as part of the Enlightenment and afterwards is an insistence on uh, or just banging on about things that they have no real definition of, no real firm grasp um, of both reason and ethics or some uh, yes uh, since then we've sort of had an insistence in the truth of our knowledge and the universality of our values and this is those two things are things that libertarianism gets right but the rest of the world doesn't seem to and I think it does go back to as Anthony said, having some kind of metaphysical foundation for them, because these are fundamentally abstract things. And you're not going to get the answers simply in looking at little empirical phenomena, and you're not going to get concrete, firm answers uh, by just making them up. Um, and so I, I think this is some, something that's symptomatic of a modern way of looking at, at things. Um, uh, I recommend a book by um, Alistair McIntyre called After Virtue, which was written in the 1980s. And he makes essentially this point that of course everyone believes in reason, and of course everyone believes in universal and yet essentially natural rights. But you've got to have some kind of system. And his answer, he's also very... Uh, big in theology, his answer is some kind of medi medieval scholastic system. But of course there are others, but you, you, you need to get the thinking right. Just a brief remark. I, I think it's related to what I call the letting loose of the virtues. Uh, I think a right was are perceived as quite a one-sided. Uh, and of course, the, the traditional answer is that rights uh, go hand in hand with duties, but that of course has been politically abused as well. I think what is meant is if you have a right, you have a duty to bear the consequences and costs of the right that you exert. Uh, uh, and once uh, this balance or structure is lost in uh, particular rights, and of course, even liberty uh, becomes a meaningless term. And it was Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychologist, who referred to this one-sidedness. He said that liberty without responsibility Leads this, to this one-sidedness, which is quite dangerous. I think that's that's correct. <laughs>
Uh, thank you. Um, actually, to follow up on the previous question, um, how how do you, because from what I've heard in the, in the uh, several talks, um, by proclaiming something as a right to have access to, uh, is basically cover for, I don't really deserve this, but you should give it to me anyways. Um, has, the, has this particular psychology been solidified and furthered by all the bailouts in 2008? Uh, a lot of young, younger people saw the older folks make mistakes, say in investments, and the, uh, the duty is to bear the losses. But uh, once the young see that the, uh, those who made the mistakes didn't have to bear the consequence, then they start asking, well, what other things that I don't really deserve, but I should have anyways, because you got what you don't deserve, uh, but you got the help. Um, would that play a part, especially in the rise of all these rights, especially in the last decade uh, that, um, that uh, uh, Dr. Daniels uh, observed? Uh, do you think that it, that particular bailout and financial crisis played a part? Not really, no, I mean, because I think this development is a, cu a deep cultural one that went back uh, much before that. And of course, uh, the freedom that most people cherish the most is the freedom of con from consequences. That's what uh, most people really would like. Um, but I, I, I think that the culture that I've described of having a right uh, to a tangible benefit uh, preceded very considerably the crash in 2008. It might, of course, uh, uh, be furthered uh, by, by seeing people not taking the consequences of their own actions. But nevertheless, uh, I think the, the, the culture that I've described preceded 2008 by quite a long time. Well, I, I think obviously it's a symptom, uh, as many other symptoms, bailouts are a symptom of the no skin in the game, no consequence uh, approach, and probably psychologically it's rather related to a higher time preference uh, and capital consumption uh, in the end. And I think the issues in morality, uh, which I've discussed and uh, you, you've discussed, I think they're also linked to a kind of higher preference morality, uh, because it's conspicuous consumption of morals, I'd say. Uh, and uh, of course leads to an abuse and consumption of cultural capital and even if there's something like more capital in the end. So I think the analogy and the symptom is, is, is quite correct. If our naivete and also our productivity is largely genetic in origin, uh, is this a source of optimism or pessimism? What could we make of it in practical terms? Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's largely genetic. Uh, epigenetic uh, plays a role, but interestingly the gaps uh, uh, have narrowed a lot and I think the reason is that the technology and capital has become so transferable all around the world and uh, that's I, I find is, is the greatest miracle that you can have high productivity uh, in very different cultures uh, and a uh, very high level of a technical uh, productive civilization in all around the world basically. There are still differences but if you measure them it's about I say maybe 10, 15 percent or something like that uh, in productivity differences. If you, I mean, if you uh, select uh, uh, for for all, uh, I mean, uh, all the variables. You know, if you can compare uh, all the variables, uh, then the difference doesn't count as much as in the past. So then, is that optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, I think rather optimistic. Uh, that means even if. Uh, uh, Central and Western Europe won't be in the future the hub of uh, entrepreneurship and productivity. There is a high chance that the torch can be passed on. Uh, uh, and of course part of it is not only the mobility of capital and ideas but also the mobility of people. Uh, might be Western Europeans just uh, living elsewhere, uh, working elsewhere. But that's part of, of the general mobility of ideas and capital which is due to the technolo technological civilization I think.
Yeah. Uh, but of course, then you can look at this, the social and societal and cultural pattern. And in politics, uh, I'd be more pessimistic. Uh, I think the worst thing you can do as a non-Western European country is to listen to the advice of Western Europeans. Uh, and I think to the history, they just have such an idealized uh, theory of politics, which is basically politics without violence. Uh, uh, and uh, it's anti-historical and anti-logical. So I'm afraid uh, of that. So in this politically, I am pessimistic, uh, uh, but e economically, I, I see, I mean, there's every chance to pass on the torch of productivity and wealth uh, in the future. And it's not dependent so much on culture anymore as it used to be. I mean, look at Saudi Arabia is potentially the place of the most advanced city if, if that project uh, uh, really works out. And uh, I'm skeptical, but uh, might really, I mean, this Neom city, maybe you've heard about it, uh, this grand idea to have a robotic city uh, with really high, highly advanced technology. I mean, if you look at the Emirates, you say, wow, may actually really work. Uh, and I think 100 years ago, you would have said no categorically, and you would be right, of course. I mean, I, out of all places, Saudi Arabia <laughs> should be a center of, of a technological civilization. But I think that shows the mobility of ideas, and it's part of a result of that cultural process in Western Europe. So uh, in a lot of ways, this history just tells you why it emerged first in Western Europe. Uh, but it doesn't tell you that it can't be passed on. Thank you all for your presentations. This question is specifically in regard to Dr. Gab's statement about how the armies of the Caliph crashed against a wall of armed freeholders. And if you could add further comment as to their structure and composition that made them militarily effective, and if that has anything to do with Rahim's statement about overlapping quasi-corporate structures, such as the family, the farm, the manor, and the church, offering social organization that made them more resilient. Thank you. Um, the, the, there was, after about, um, after about 400 AD, the, there was a substantial, though unquantifiable, uh, fall of human populations, probably throughout the world. Uh, and um, although before about 300 AD, battles looked rather like the battles that we imagine as large national armies with, with professional officers and generals and baggage trains and so on, uh, during the during the medieval period, was well, th there were not that there wasn't that much in the way of a standing army in any European state. Um, it, it was largely a case of small bands of people who would come together for specific purposes. And so, when I talk about the armies of the Caliph, I, I'm not talking about some vast army with green banners and uh, kettle drums playing. Ma marching forward, we're probably talking about a few hundred horsemen at a time, uh, raiding parties more than attempts at conquest. Uh, but they were met in, in this part of the world and somewhat to the south, they were met by organized groups of villagers who, who put down their agricultural tools and, and took up the tools of war uh, and went off and drove away these ra raiders. And, and so um, perhaps the armies of the Caliph was a rhetorical exaggeration. But it does remain to be said that um, there was in Western Europe almost no popular resistance to the barbarian invasions. It is very hard to find any resistance, certainly in Gaul. There were some in Italy to the Lombards, but there was very little in France, in Spain, or even in North Africa. Whereas um, in this part of the world, in the territory of modern Turkey, the, um, the people were given pieces of land, they were given the right and the obligation to bear arms in defense of that land, and they felt that they had a country. And so, yes, they fought for it. 
and for a very long time they won. I think, Sean, uh, in trying to rehabilitate the Byzantine Empire, which I find is a very worthy uh, thing to do, uh, you have neglected uh, to mention that the, uh, uh, how the, Vien the Venice uh, fleet uh, was quite important <laughs> to the survival of it. And I think Venice, of course, is more uh, according uh, or more European in the sense that it's a frontier autonomous, small-scale, merchant-oriented empire, not so much, uh, not so much a large-scale, organized uh, state. Uh, uh, and uh, I think without those uh, city-states at the frontier, uh, Europe uh, would have fallen uh, in the end. I'd like to, um, to make a point for the rationalization for, for science or the Enlightenment, maybe in a, in a, in a German sense. And, um, couldn't it be, or couldn't you make the point that it, this rationalization, this fi finding of the scientific method was a, a very good thing and that it, um, that it improved living standards drastically and, and, and improved the whole of Europe and, and, uh, and basically um, changed the whole world to, to where we are right now. And, um, it's a very powerful tool, and like any powerful tool, it can be used in different ways. If you would use it in a correct way, you, for example, would seek in, in, in history and um, come up with uh, something like the Byzantine Empire was uh, not so unimportant after all. But if you, if you put it in, I don't know, state's hand, um, this, um, this tool is being misused or overused, and, uh, and that couldn't be that this is the case for bad, uh, the bad consequences we, we are seeing instead of, uh, I think you call it um, a wrong way of thinking. So isn't that? Uh, I agree with everything you said. Um, and I, I hope I said, um, I, hope, I hope I made the disclaimer that I think particularly the, the scientific revolution that you would associate with the Scottish and, and some English thinkers of the 17th century was absolutely fine when applied to its proper sphere of interest, so to speak. I would completely agree with you. Um, the reason I was um, a bit nasty about Steven Pinker is um, he made the complete opposite of, of, um, of, of that sort of um, point. Um, he spends a lot of the book pointing out the obvious that nowadays even the poorest um, are overweight rather than malnourished. Um, lots of people have um, smart mobile telephones, all that sort of stuff. Um, and yet then he uh, argues that um, that uh, that is that the scientific um, approach is something that you can apply to every sphere of life and thought. And that's what um, people who've taken issue with the book are taking issue with. Um, but no, the scientific revolution I have absolutely no, no problem with, really. Uh, you see repeatedly uh, scientific uh, ideas rather than scientific ideas, so that you have uh, Marxism, uh, Darwinism, Freudianism, uh, behaviorism, now we have the neurosciences, which are going to tell us how to live. You just have to put someone in some kind of um, uh, uh, scanner, and it will tell you how to live. This, this is the kind of absurd hope. Uh, but it seems to me that's obviously absurd. I don't, it's not that I can tell you uh, uh, what the answer to how to live actually is. I, uh, but science is not going to tell us how to live. Okay, but allow me one rem remark uh, in, in order to defend science. Marx is not scientific. No, I, it's, it's scientistic. It's scientistic. Okay. It's a, it Sorry. takes on the... Uh, nor is Darwinist uh, s um, psychology, which tells us, in my belief, doesn't tell us anything about human existence uh, at all, really. Uh, any more than does behaviorism or, uh, uh, and I don't think Freudianism does. And you're as well off, uh, when it comes to psychology, you're as well, more, much better off uh, 
uh, reading literature than you are reading psychology, except in small, isolated spheres. But you can't, uh, you can't treat life as if it's an extended case of arachnophobia. Uh, to be, <laughs> there is no technical problem, uh, to li or no solution to the problem of life that is merely technical. <clears throat> I have a, another question regarding enlightenment. Um, um, Kurt Martland told us about two visions of Martland uh, of, of enlightenment: uh, the process of enlightenment, which, in my opinion, gave way to the liberal revolutions and to individual freedom and to a uh, an attitude regarding uh, individual life, uh, which caused probably the, the few experiments in liberal states, classical liberal states in the, in the 18th and 19th century. On the other hand, the scientific mentality of a part of enlightenment may have given ri er, rise to the idea that society is something that can be experimented with and so Maybe this is the cause of social engineering and of our modern managerial states, where uh, anything is can be done with the with the with the societies which are not independent organisms anymore. So, I would like to hear a take on these two aspects of enlightenment. Um, so you, you're saying that the that one is a controlling and one is a, a, a process, right? Um, yeah, I, I agree, but um, the, the problem with enlightenment ideas to the extent that we can construct them and synthesize them and so on is um, they're often quite subtle, or they should be put forward in a much more subtle way. And um, what it often... Uh, devolves into is um, I know Rahim used the term earlier and I, I, I take his point but it's, a, it's such a convenient term um, it, does, it does degenerate into virtue signaling um, to the point where these very subtle ideas become simply shouting over and over again reason uh, freedom and so on and uh, it becomes less about these things and more about telling people how enlightened we really are. And um, yes, so <laughs> that said, um, there is something uh, to uh, the uh, criticisms made of, um, of enlightenment, of, of the enlightenment project, uh, made by some very disreputable thinkers like uh, Adorno and, and Foucault who are generally rubbish on, on most things, but uh, on this they detect, as you said, a controlling impulse, uh, an authoritarian streak. Um, and it's um, in, uh, in a sense because of the internal contradictions, I would say, um, or the lack of any firm grounding. Um, but yes, certainly I would prefer to stick with the much less grandiose uh, idea of enlightenment as a process which takes into account human nature a bit more. Uh, there's a story that I like about the Enlightenment is that there are uh, two different traditions and uh, one tradition uh, might be a Scottish-Austrian one and that the Austrian school actually is part of a different uh, tradition which uh, is a tradition of Enlightenment uh, but it's much closer and of course a lot of uh, intellectual influence uh, from the Scottish Enlightenment uh, and uh, the argument is that the difference may have been practically that in both in Vienna uh, and in Scotland uh, uh, at times of, of the Enlightenment there was more exchange between practical entrepreneurs 
and those people trying to understand the world around them. In Scotland, it was the uh, tobacco merchants uh, who had quite a lot of leisure time. Uh, and so actually, in, in the lecture hall of Adam Smith, you had really merchants, entrepreneurs sitting there and being interested in the ideas. And the very similar thing happened in Austria. Austria, uh, Vienna was at the time uh, when the Austrian school emerged uh, the center of oriental trade in Europe. Uh, uh, so you had a lot of merchants uh, with, with a quite uh, large outlook on the world, and they would meet in the coffee houses and the salons uh, uh, and uh, I think that uh, people with a practical responsibility taking an interest in ideas uh, uh, that you have a natural kind of checks and balances to this idealistic kind of enlightenment as a movement uh, 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 because uh, in practical reality there are so many paradoxical things which you only realize by trial and error it's by it's completely irrational to try to be always rational, but you can't just figure it out, you learn it by experience, uh, uh, and so on. And I think it's with every one of those buzzwords uh, of the Enlightenment uh, that practical experience leads to kind of checks and balances on these grandiose ideas. Um, uh, a, uh, one of the figures of the Enlightenment, David Hume, implicit in his work actually is that reason cannot tell us everything uh, cannot tell us how to behave. He actually says that you cannot derive an ought from an is. And if that is the case, you can't point to anything in the world which will tell you exactly how to behave. So there is a, an irreducible uh, impossibility of leading a completely rational life which some of the more extreme um, proponents of uh, the Enlightenment believed that there was. But so he was both Enlightenment and counter-Enlightenment at the same time. Western European societies as non-tribal societies, what happens if a tribal society meets um, a Western society as you described it. You would expect some tensions, some incompatibilities or so to arise, which is of course something that we are currently seeing in the Western world. I think uh, what what's happening is that uh, I mean, those non-tribal Western societies uh, have turned to a kind of formalistic universalism, uh, uh, which basically just boils down to treat everyone the same. And of course, traditionally, justice means sum quick, we treat everyone as he deserves. Uh, uh, if you have this kind of universalism, which is an unchecked uh, virtue running loose, uh, and you treat everyone the same, and you have a tribal society mixing in a non-tribal society, you have uh, people with non-universalistic ethics which of course take advantage of people with a un more universalist ethics, uh, but at the same time, they are pointing the finger at problems of a structure of trust. Uh, uh, so I think it's a challenge, and it, it would be cynical to say it's a welcome challenge, uh, but maybe a wake-up call for Western society. And I think this exchange with people coming from more tribal mindsets can lead to reflection and understanding that the institutional pattern uh, is no longer in accordance with the cultural pattern in Western Europe. Uh, and uh, because, and that's what's happening right now, this universalist non-tribal ethic uh, leads of course to results uh, when you treat everyone the same, which either you have to treat everyone as a child or a criminal, yeah, and it's where it's going, uh, other way, it's, it's, it's just not working out. And people are realizing that actually it's two sets of ethics. Uh, because if you treat everyone the same, and there's an invisible part of obligations that people follow culturally, of course, you don't treat everyone the same. Because everyone has to pay the same tax, but not everyone has the same tax honesty, as they say. And then, of course, the same treatment leads to totally different outcomes. And that's what, uh, on the ground, I think a lot of Western Europeans realize that they are held to rules which can't be applied anymore, can't be executed anymore universally. So either you go back down to non-universal rules, and then, of course, you, uh, try, you need to break up this kind of artificial uh, 
create um, nation state, universalistic nation state, uh, and I think that's what happening, uh, what's happening right now. So I don't see just a confrontation, I see an invitation to reflect uh, Western society and reflect the institutions of Western society and how they match or don't match uh, the cultural shape. And uh, in the end, of course, it may boil to, to what they call the parallel societies. Uh, it's a non-universalist society with parallel moral, legal codes, and so on, uh, and that would be a typical pattern. Maybe more aligned with a, non, uh, uh, with a more decentralized approach, but that would be too optimistic, probably. Uh. Uh, actually, we can see a big difference how Western and Eastern European states handle the immigration uh, crisis. Uh, what would be your explanation for that phenomenon? Well, there's a positive and a negative explanation. The negative explanation is uh, that in measures of trust, Eastern Europeans are lacking. Uh, uh, and of that means the, it's harder to take advantage of them, but it also means they are less welcoming to uh, different people. I think, uh, totally contrary to what we are told in the media, Western Europe is one of the least racist societies on Earth. Uh, and that's peculiar about it, because as a non-tribal society, if you're functional and productive, it's very welcoming society it's possible to be taken in and I, I think it's a good thing and I think that's a negative thing in parts of Eastern Europe and just going back of course to this kind of shutting everyone out uh, is not necessarily the best answer but practically of course it leads uh, uh, to uh, this uh, preservance of national sovereignty uh, on a national level and that was a cultural achievement as well it's just I think it's halfway but uh, uh, it's it's not too bad a lot of our liberties are linked to that kind of uh, national community where even democracy seemed to work for a while and that's quite odd. I mean, uh, and I think the main argument against, or one of the best arguments against socialism is that even the Germans couldn't make it work. Uh, and I think more or less the same is with democracy. And uh, the positive reason would, of course, be that uh, in Eastern Europe they have the historical experience, which far more recent of not being sovereign states. Uh, and so, of course, it's much more important uh, to their whole understanding and, and, and uh, historical perception of their identities. Tony, just one for you, and I, I'm not sure if I asked you this yes, last year, and I apologize if I did, but your comments uh, reminded me of it. Um, you, know, you talked about how reason isn't prescriptive in terms of living. Um, what is your opinion of the underlying ideas and the phenomenon that is Jordan Peterson? Well, I'm sorry to say I must be one of the few people on the earth who has not followed him very closely. So, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, he is um, a master of the higher cliché. <laughs> and that what he says is perfectly obvious, M much of what he says is perfectly obvious, uh, and it's a sign of the times that uh, the perfectly obvious should uh, have such uh, an effect. But I don't know his, I haven't read his book, and uh, I must confess that I would have to know that I was going to live to be about 500 years old before I would consider reading it, um, because there are many things which are more interesting to me. He's a Jungian psychologist, so maybe... Uh, well, that's a very bad thing. <laughs> that's what that's I <laughs> that, that, uh, but I, as far as I can tell, he does say things which are fairly commonsensical, aren't they? Uh, it's just that common sense isn't very common. But I don't, I don't know his work. I wanted to add something to Rahim. Uh, we are, in Turkey, we are extremely complaining about all the immigrants. And we have much, much more immigrants than any country in Europe. And everybody complains. I mean, that they get better treatment in hospitals, that the hospitals are full of them, that they get payment from, from government without doing anything and uh, that all parts of uh, cities are only uh, by now inhabited by them, that uh, they label their own shops and everything. But uh, the main difference is that complaining here is not politically incorrect. <laughs>
So that's the main difference. <laughs> oh, I have a question to Anthony. Um, assuming that um, right uh, hyperinflation uh, would follow the same behavioral patterns as a money hyperinflation, um, when do you consider the moment of a general right replacement, right reduction, especially because the increasing lack of enforcement seems to enjoy a bigger tolerance than in case of a money hyperinflation? Well, unfortunately, I can't give you any answer. Um, I, d I don't see easily a, uh, a reversal of this uh, trend. And um, the only way that it's going to come about is either uh, through circumstances which make the uh, which make the fulfilment, even the partial fulfilment of the rights, impossible, which would uh, actually cause a lot of uh, social unrest, or alternatively, uh, a lot of work has to be done to persuade people. Uh, that their ideas are actually mistaken, um, and uh, but I, I don't want the first scenario. I don't want there to be a kind of social breakdown, uh, and I don't really see many people arguing against the idea of rights in our society. So I'm uh, somewhat pessimistic about uh, uh, about the possibility of change. I, th I think there might be some kind of, uh, I think there is a f um, there's some reason to be hopeful when you look at the state of the modern left, who seem to be eating each other. And uh, you look at, uh, for instance, the uh, transsexual activists and the homosexual activists. They are frequently clashing with one another. Um, I think one of the more common Sorry, one of the more famous examples was when Germaine Greer, who is a very radical feminist um, and has been for some time, was deemed not extreme left enough uh, by, uh, by the transsexual activists because she, as a very proud feminist, doesn't believe that a man who decides to change his sex has become a woman. Uh, and you, you see more and more of these, these sorts of uh, incidents, though. And I, I, I don't know if it's simply uh, enjoyable to watch, or whether whether there might be something good that will come of it in the long term. I don't know, but that's that's my two cents. <laughs> yes, I think I, I I agree that it um, partly comes down to the increasing. Uh, and self-refuting absurdity of um, th this entire movement. But uh, a somewhat more optimistic observation, I think, is um, to quote Thomas Kuhn, that, that uh, re revolutions tend to happen one retirement party at a time. There is no persuading the present elites in our civilization, elites broadly defined, that they are wrong or, or that there is anything wrong with their ideas. The ideas that they adopted when they were very young have brought them, um, uh, they have brought them status and financial security and power and, and all the things that normal human beings long to have. Uh, and so they will not abandon those ideas. But as these people get old and retire, or perhaps preferably die, um, you may see the, the re-emergence of, uh, not of rationality, but simply of common sense. I, I certainly hope so, but do you actually, I mean, I have no contact with young people, so I can't say. Um, uh, but uh, do you see it in, uh, amongst young students? Do you see any rejection of these old ideas in young students? I, I don't know. I'm just asking. Um, Keir observed recently that most of my students are rather odd. <laughs> I don't know if that's 
if that's how I make them or if they, or if they see me and run towards me. But um, my experience is that young people are deeply cynical about the whole process. There is almost no belief in the system in which they live and which they will, in the normal course of events, take over. Forty years ago, well, perhaps 35 when I was young, 35 years ago when I was younger, um, there were many people of my age who sincerely believed that these absurdities would produce a, a better and, and kinder world. I don't think there are many young people who seriously believe those propositions anymore. Perhaps they believe things are even worse, but I, I doubt it. I, I don't see many young people who believe this nonsense. Oh, I have no doubt there are many young people who find it, um, th they find it highly convenient to appear to believe it, but there's a difference between apparent belief and belief. Because I am a young person, I think I should say something about it, but um, no, I would just echo what Sean said um, in, in my experience. Um, perhaps less so in the universities, uh, but outside of the universities, uh, people from uh, people who are going, say, straight into business or something like that, are much, much more uh, likely to reject the nonsense that you get in in politics and the mainstream media and so on, and and to actually be quite deeply sound on a number of things. Um, certainly much sounder than their parents because there is a lot of resentment um, that their parents' generation has got them into a, a, bad, uh, a bad state generally. People look to their, their parents' generation and, and, and blame them, um, not only for the economic problems but also for the cultural and social degeneracy that they, they see around them. And, and um, yeah, uh, they, they wish their parents had been a bit more right-wing and so they're, they're often uh, take it upon themselves. You remember three years ago in September we had our conference here and a few days after this massive movement of migrants started exactly here in Podrum, went to the Greek islands, from the Greek islands to the Balkan countries and up the Balkans uh, to Austria and uh, Germany and Sweden. Now, uh, what happened then is very interesting if we, if we confront it with what happened with the barbaric invasions in, uh, in the end of the Roman Empire. Why? Because uh, what, uh, the, the behavior of, of Greece, of Macedonia, of Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, and so on, uh, was simply, uh, we don't want you, but you can cross our country because you're invited by the Germans, so please cross it. Uh, don't uh, create uh, too much troubles. Uh, we will help you. We give you uh, possibilities to take the train, the buses, and whatever. And the Germans will take you. Uh, the, uh, the Eastern Roman policy uh, was different in, uh, in what regarded the immigration uh, uh, pressure which came out from, from, uh, from, from the eastern part and from, from, from the Asiatic, uh, from, from the Asian part. Uh, they didn't take them in. But the Western Roman, uh, the Western Roman uh, uh, Empire changed and liberalized its immigration policy uh, dramatically between the second uh, century and the f fourth and fifth century. So it was very easy for them to enter. So the breakdown of the frontiers of, 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 uh, of the Western uh, Roman Empire was not only the effect of a military invasion brought from outside, but it was already the effect of a, of a, a broad system of uh, contracts with tribes, with uh, 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 Germanic tribes, who were incorporated inside uh, the Western Europe, the, 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 the Western Roman country. And there I think uh, this is one of the explanations why uh, the Eastern part of the Roman Empire could survive so much longer than the Western part. Um, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> 
around the year uh, around the year 500 it was reasonably plain in this part of the world that um, the presence of large numbers of Germanic barbarians might not be entirely in the public interest. And, and yet, in all the great cities of the East, there were large numbers of Germanic mercenaries and their families. They had settled. And so, one day, all, a, a decree was sent out and published in all the cities that Germanic barbarians should meet together in the main public square of the town at a specific time when they would hear something very much to their advantage from the government. And so the appointed day came, the barbarian mercenaries were gathered there with their families, their wives and their children, and um, suddenly archers appeared from behind various columns and massacred all of them. And this is not an entirely reliable story. It's in Gibbon. Uh, Gibbon's comment is that he will make no comment on this. There are times when the most awful things may be justified in the public interest, but he has no interest in either condemning or defending such things. But, but undoubtedly the Eastern Empire found a way of managing those people who entered its territory. Um, oh, it's a long, long story. There are so many things that you could talk about. You could talk about the geography of it. I if you look at a map of the Eastern Roman Empire, you you'll see that it's broken in two and you've got the choke point at Constantinople. It, it means that barbarians can sweep through the Balkans, they can burn, they can rape, they can murder. They reach the walls of Constantinople and they can go no further. Or the Arabs can break through the defenses and sweep through Anatolia. Um, and again, they reach the walls of Constantinople, but they can't cross the straits. And uh, it is very difficult to have two enemies from the north and the south attacking the city at the same time because Byzantine control of the sea means that those enemies cannot coordinate their actions. Now, th th this is a geographical advantage which doesn't exist I in Western Europe, but th there are so many things that I could say, but it's uh, three minutes to six. I'm convinced that uh, most Eastern European countries are not more racist uh, than Western Europe. At least I can speak for Hungary. Um, people are used to speak more openly. That's the main difference. Civilization means um, often um, means not in all cases not being racist, but not speaking about it openly. And this is, in my opinion, the big difference. The other one is, I think um, Eastern Europeans are different because they used to be parts of empires. They didn't choose themselves. Since the 15th uh, century, uh, they were parts of the Turkish uh, empire. After that, of uh, then uh, Austria, which might be a very civilized uh, empire, and still it was not chosen voluntarily by these countries. And the last uh, um, 60 years, uh, they were part of the socialist uh, camp. Um, uh, you could say they were uh, subjects of the Soviet Union. Um, so, um, I believe they learned a lot uh, by being subjects uh, of empires, and this makes uh, the main difference uh, uh, in their attitude um, uh, towards dangers or things they uh, estimate as dangers uh, for their national sovereignty.
Thank you so much for a contradiction. That's, I, I loved it. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I mean, talk about who's more racist, I, 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 I won't <laughs> take picked it up it's as I tried to uh, explain that's become really complicated to figure out who's racist and, and who's not uh, I think it's not a good label to use anymore uh, well, so I'd, I I'd rather live uh, w uh, both in uh, I spent the first yeah. part of my life in Hungary and uh, since 30 or, mm -hmm. or more years I live in Germany so mm -hmm. I have a good uh, ground for a comparison uh, so therefore that I dare to say uh, uh, mm -hmm. that at yeah. least Hungarians are not more racist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and less anti-Semitic than mm -hmm. the Germans are. There, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Well, uh, sociologically, there seems to be evi evidence that there's difference in trust. And of course, one of the things is that there is less trust, in, or used to be less trust in governments and the state, in particular in the countries that were part of the Ottoman Empire and, uh, of course, the Soviet uh, Empire uh, and so on. So that, that's a very valid point. But interestingly, uh, it can't explain the difference in trust entirely. So you can see uh, that thing, but still within society, there is sociological evidence, of course, a statistical evidence. It's not true for everyone, and uh, it's just a uh, kind of density of results that you get. That Hungarians seem to do a little worse than Western Europeans in cooperating among each other. Yeah? Uh, that's the difference. And uh, I would tend to assume as a non-Hungarian, and it's a totally a difficult <laughs> language, of course, to acquire, to become really part of Hungary. I, I, I know quite a few Austrians who live uh, uh, in Hungary and of course they don't want to integrate and they are left alone. So that's, uh, is that a great thing? I, I don't know. Uh, there is no effort to integrate them into Hungarian society. Uh, so the Hungarians don't, are not very forthcoming, but uh, of course they are not evil people, they are not racist in the sense that uh, as an Austrian living in Hungary you'd have any problem with your neighbors. Uh, uh, I think you'd maybe even have less problems but that <laughs> than living in, in, in Austria, but that could be other cultural things. So if you, you have to control for the, ri the rivals, which is uh, <laughs> totally impossible of course. As a modern society you can have that homogeneity so that uh, really the state apparatus of violence is equal society and equal is totally homogeneous religiously, culturally and so on at the size of a nation state. Uh, uh, so I'm maybe a bit more skeptical but of course if you compare uh, uh, it's totally, it, it seems evident that you can't talk about certain subjects in Germany or among Germans uh, uh, but I think Gülchin gave a very very uh, good and uh, bright example of uh, what might be the repercussions uh, percussions about uh, these things. Of course, uh, in China it's no problem to talk about Bai Zhuo, uh, and uh, you can be really outspoken about Western society. Uh, you can't really be that outspoken about uh, Chinese uh, society. Uh, so that's a bit unfair to compare it like that and uh, just say, wow, it's, it would be amazing freedom to be in China and just criticize German society compared to Germany. Yeah, and uh, I'd be wary that the same might ring true in Hungary and that over time I think uh, it uh, might feel more difficult to criticize Hungarian culture, Hungarian society. I mean, I don't say that you have to and that you should, uh, uh, but uh, I think it'll be unfair to compare uh, this way. But thanks a lot for your contradiction. I think it's a very valuable insight.